Good morning. And welcome to worship here in the Old Kirk. And a warm welcome to those watching online and to those listening on the dial of sermon service. Uh, one or two intimations this morning. First of all, the uh, Men's Guild meet tomorrow night for a uh, games night. The lunch is on Tuesday and the Guild uh, is, meets on February the 2nd. Also a reminder, this being the last Sunday of the month, we have teas and coffees in the hall after the service. Our uh, Burn Supper takes place on Saturday the 11th of February. Tickets are going fast, so if you want to make sure you get a ticket, please speak to Fred um, at the door at the end of the service. Also, um, we've had a um, poster or a leaflet handed in by um, the occupational therapy team from uh, the NHS. And there are some leaflets at the door. Um, it's really just offering various bits of advice um, for our very young geriatrics. Um, but um, there's some useful information on it and if you just want to take one of the things away with you um, either for yourself or for somebody um, that uh, they're willing to come out and speak to people and, and maybe give you a wee bit of advice on what you can do in your house to make things easier um, so please take one of the leaflets um, if you feel it's appropriate and finally just uh, I want to read a bit of a card um, that I received it's from uh, Ian Gemmell um, and it just says thanks too for the flowers and many cards received um, finally, we were all touched and grateful for the kindness shown by very many in the church and in particular for those who were present at mum's funeral. Obviously, Ian's mum, Margaret, died um, a few weeks ago and it's just a wee thank you from uh, the family. So I thought that would be appropriate to read that out. We're going to sit quietly as we remember the folks in Ukraine. Thank you. We sing, Thy kingdom come, O Lord. Let us pray. Living and loving God, 
Once more, we bring you our praise and worship. We acknowledge you as our God. We recognize your greatness and power. We marvel at your love and compassion. We come before you with awe and wonder. You are Lord of heaven and earth, of space and time, of this world and all of the universe, of life and death. Living and loving God, draw near to us and help us to draw near to you. Come to us through your Holy Spirit and help us to open our hearts to the risen Christ. Speak to us through the worship we offer this day and through it deepen our faith. Loving God, we praise you that there is so much that speaks to us of your love and purpose, so much in our lives, in our daily experience, in the world around us, in the vastness of the universe, in the fellowship we share with one another, and in the relationship we enjoy with you, through which you teach and guide and challenge us. Forgive us that we do not sometimes hear your voice, that often we do not want to hear. Forgive us that sometimes we refuse to listen, that often we are closed to anything but our own words. Living God, we pray for ourselves as day by day we are confronted with the need to choose. Sometimes the choice is clear, sometimes confusing, sometimes easy, sometimes hard, sometimes mattering little, sometimes much. But help us, whatever the case, to gladly accept the responsibility of choosing, recognizing that it is a privilege of being human. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Help us to decide wisely, seeking your will and responding to your guidance. Help us to admit our error when we choose wrongly and be ready to change our decisions when necessary. And help us to remember when we go astray that you are always there to help us start again. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And hear us now as we say our family prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'm going to ask Helen to read our lessons. Today's first reading is taken from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 10 to 25. Hear the word of the Lord. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say, and that there is no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and in thought. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Apollos. Another, I follow Cephas. Still another, I follow Christ. But is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptised in the name of Paul? I thank God that I did not baptise any of you except Crispus and Gaius. So no one can say that you were baptised in my name. Yes, I also baptised the household of Stephanas. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptised anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptise, but to preach the gospel. Not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. Where is the wise person? 
Where is the teacher of the law? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Amen. Our second reading is from the book of John, chapter 13, verses 1 to 11. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, You do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, Not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, Those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that was why he said not everyone was clean. Amen, and may God bless these readings from his holy word, and to him be all glory and praise. Thank you. We sing, Will you come and follow me? if I but call your name.
Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, Father, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. When I was growing up, I seemed to remember that when ministers spoke about characters like Abraham and Moses and David in the Old Testament, or Peter and Andrew and John in the New Testament, they always portrayed them as being somehow better than I could ever be. They were special in a way that I could never achieve. They were important, and so God called them to do important things. Abraham built a nation. Moses freed a people. David defeated an overwhelming enemy. Peter became the rock that the church was built on. Andrew made the feeding of the 5,000 possible. And John wrote a gospel that has challenged, inspired, and encouraged Christians for almost two centuries. How can I possibly compete with such greatness? And that sense of inferiority stayed with me until I went to university and did a little reading into who these people really were. And I discovered that they were no better than me and that they had as many, if not more, faults than I had. For example, when God told Abraham that he was going to be a father, he point-blankly refused to believe God. Moses ran away to the desert when God called him to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt. And David sent his best friend Uriah to battle in order to seduce his wife. Peter and John both had terrible tempers. And I don't mention this in any way to belittle these people. I mention it because I want to say to you that God has only ever once used a perfect person. And that was Jesus. On every other occasion, he has used flawed human beings to do wonderful things. There are no second-class citizens in God's kingdom. There is no them and us. God loves each of his children equally. And we are all as equally as useful to him. I have no doubts that if God decided to write a sequel to the Bible, then it could include stories about people like May Ogilvy, who must have had a soggy shoulder from all the time someone had a little cry on it. Or what about Nettie Morrow? Was there ever anyone as good at telling you that Jesus loved you? And then there was Bill McMillan. How many families benefited from his generosity and were left two bags of coal instead of one? Or a bill that just happened to go missing? The people of the Old Kirk today are no less useful to God than the so-called greats of the Bible. Because they were just like us. The only difference was, they were more willing to say yes to God when he asked them to do great things. Abraham gave up his home to follow, Moses stood up to Pharaoh, and David accepted Goliath's challenge. The achievements of these people had nothing to do with them being better than us. All they did was say yes to God. And that's why the Bible is such an important book. Because it contains stories of what ordinary people like you and I can achieve if we let God work through us. Abraham and David, Peter and John, weren't the architects of their fame. They were merely the hands and eyes and voices of God. And we are called, called to follow in their footsteps today. Their achievements, their successes ought to inspire us to do likewise today. Because we are just like them. Now having said that, the opposite is also true. While we might well think we could never be like Daniel and face down a lion or stand up to the queen like Elijah did, I suspect that most of us would also like to think that we wouldn't have been so foolish as the Israelites to put our faith in a calf made of gold. Nor would we have betrayed Je Jesus in the way that Judas did. But just as we are as capable of those great feats in the Bible, so we are as capable of letting God down. And that's why the Bible contains chapters like the one we read from Paul's first letter to the church in Corinth. Having helped set up and organize the church in Corinth during his visit there, 
Paul must have been extremely disappointed when he learned that the church was quarreling amongst itself. Some were following Apollos, others Cephas, and some even claimed to be following Paul. Now, we don't know if these people were actively trying to gain power or if it was just different groups who felt they were more important than anyone else. But Paul reminds them in no uncertain terms that they should all be following Jesus. That anyone who tries to promote themselves in such a way is detracting from the job of preaching the gospel. He appeals for unity, a common sense of purpose. Later in the letter, he uses the analogy of the body to support his call for unity. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God has arranged the organs in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single organ, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. And I believe that along with the verses in Matthew chapter 25 about feeding and clothing people, where Matthew writes, they will also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a neighbor or needing clothes or ill or in prison and did not help you? And Jesus will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Those two passages in Matthew and Corinthians are some of the most important verses in the Bible because they are a warning to us today of what can happen when we take our eyes off Christ, when we substitute our goals for God's. And just as we should be inspired to do as Abraham and Elijah did when it comes to believing that God can use us, because we are no different from them, so we should be aware that we are just as capable of falling into the sins of the first century church as the Christians then were. There is a course that every Church of Scotland minister has to complete before they are allowed to be ordained. And it involves conflict resolution training for when someone other than the guild uses their china. I am, of course, joking. Maybe. But it's true that in every church there will be times when one group feels that it is more important than another or that the aims of one group are somehow in conflict with someone else, or when one organization feels threatened or overshadowed by another. Tensions arise, and people fall out with one another. Things are said in the heat of the moment, and sides are taken. Which then leads to people having to use much-needed time and energy to resolve the conflicts, and to get people back on track. And Paul was trying in the nicest possible way to tell the members of the church in Corinth to put self to one side and to remember that it isn't about whose side Jesus is on. It is about whether we are on Jesus' side. As the guild, the men's guild, the lunches, the warm spaces, the session, the prayer group, we should all be working together to promote Jesus and his gospel. Not complaining that someone else is getting more of the limelight than we are. We must do everything in our power to avoid letting the kind of splits that Paul encountered in Corinth. Because they do not enhance the building of the kingdom. They inhibit it. We need to value what we do. But more importantly, we need to value what others do for Jesus. Because as Paul said to the Corinthians, each part of the body is as important as the other. And that a body cannot function properly if everyone wants to be an eye or a foot or an ear. And the same applies to our discussions with St. Andrews and St. Columbus. We need to value the work they are doing in the name of Jesus. They are not in competition with us. They are complementary to us. 
And we will be better and stronger when we start working together. The Bible is full of stories of people just like us doing incredible things for God. Not because they are better than us, but because they said yes to God. We need to drum up the courage they found so that we too can say yes. And we too can play our part to the full in the building of the kingdom of God here in this place. But we also need to take heed of the warnings <coughs> contained in the Bible. So that we can avoid falling into the same pitfalls as the Corinthian church <coughs> fell. We have to put self after Jesus. I believe that we still have a few Abrahams, Elijahs and Andrews in the pews. But do you? Amen. And may God add this blessing to these thoughts. And to his name be the praise and the glory. We worship God with our offering and we sing the doxology. For I am building a people of power. Let us pray. Father God, day by day, you provide for all our needs. You have done so from the day we were born and you will do so till the day we leave this earth. And we are grateful. And today we bring our offering before you as a token of our appreciation, asking that you would use it so that others might have their needs provided for as well. Bless our giving and use it to build your kingdom. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Today is Holocaust Sunday, and so we begin our prayers for others with a prayer for those who were killed during the Holocaust. Let us pray. Loving God, we come to you with heavy hearts, remembering the six million Jewish souls murdered during the Holocaust. In the horror, horrors of that history, when so many groups were targeted for their identity and in genocides which have followed, we recognize the destructive prejudices that drive people apart. Forgive us when we give space to fear, negativity and hatred of others, simply because they are different from us. In the light of God, we see everyone as equally precious manifestations of the divine and can know the courage to face the darkness. Through our prayers and actions, help us to stand together with those who are suffering, so that light may banish all darkness, that love will prevail over hate, and that good will triumph over evil. Living God, we pray for those wrestling with difficult and demanding questions, those facing complex matters of conscience, those struggling with confusing moral decisions, those wrestling with controversial social issues, those coping with challenging theological concerns. Grant to all in such situations your wisdom and help them to find the right way forward. We pray for those who are faced with awkward yet important choices between good and evil, right and wrong, truth and falsehood, love and hate, between the way of the world and the way of Christ, the way of self and the way of service. Give to all faced with such choices the courage to take your way. We pray for your church, 
Save it from naive fundamentalism, from being judgment, from judgmental attitudes, from dogmatically believing it has the answers to every situation. Grant to your people everywhere the humility to recognize that asking questions is part of the faith. Living God, we pray for ourselves as day by day we are confronted with the need to choose. Sometimes the choice is clear, sometimes confusing, sometimes easy, sometimes hard, sometimes mattering little, sometimes much. But help us, whatever the case, to gladly accept the responsibility of choosing, recognizing that it is part of our human privilege. Help us to decide wisely, seeking your will and responding to your guidance. Help us to admit our errors when we choose wrongly and be ready to change our decisions when necessary. And help us to remember when we go astray that you are always there to help us start again. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the name of Christ. Amen. Can I remind you that Fred is there if you wish tickets for the bum supper and that the occupational health leaflets are ready to be picked up. We close by singing the church's one foundation.
And now may grace, mercy and peace from God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit be with you and all those you love now and evermore. God bless and keep safe.